Hey everybody, I'm Zeke with SDI. I'm the chair of their School of Firearms Technology and today I'm here with Kip. Uh, he is with American Gunsmithing in Columbia, Tennessee. Also is going to be an instructor for us here soon, which is going to be really cool. So any of the coursework you're taking, he may or may not be an instructor, you get to interact with him. But today we're going to do a little introduction into gunsmithing, kind of what to expect you chose to go into this course, uh, basic tools, some tips and tricks, and then we'll even get to see different types of firearms here in a second. So. Kip, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Let's get to it. All right. So you guys decided to go off into gunsmithing. Well, it's a great, great career choice. If you love guns, if you love repairing things, if you love learning things and continue to learn things, this could be the, the, the place for you to go and, and expand your career. You can expect to see everything from maybe doing a simple restoration job on an old flintlock rifle like this, or a percussion cap rifle. Or you may even go as far as to have a machine gun brought into your shop that somebody needs to be repaired on. The sky's the limit on how far you want to take it. It's up to you and your abilities and your eagerness to learn and what you want to learn. With the proper attitude, there's nothing you can't do in this business. When I got into this business, I probably about 14 years of age. I had a friend of mine whose dad was a gunsmith. I considered a master gunsmith. He would come home on the weekends, and he would take us out to the woods hunting, shooting, whatever. And if we did something of that nature, he would always bring home a gun. And the first thing he would do is tear it down to us, put it back together, reload our own ammo. And that's really where I fell in love with gunsmithing. And I expanded from there and just learned and learned and learned all these years. But the reason we need gunsmiths out there, just in the recent few years, millions of guns are out there right now in the public. And somebody's got to fix them. Somebody's got to repair them. Somebody's got to clean them. Somebody's got to do upgrades to them. That could be you. Just like it's me. And, and, and what separates the good ones from the bad ones is your eagerness to learn. And, and going somewhere where you can get that education, where you will learn how to do things correctly. You know the system. Do you know how to fix that gun when it's put in your hand? It may be a gun you've never saw before, but because of your knowledge and your skills, you can go in there and troubleshoot it and know what you're looking at. And that's going to make your name get out there like crazy. That's going to separate you from the guy down the street. That's where your customers are going to tell everybody. You know, you got to live by the old rule in this business. If you do something great for somebody, they might tell 10 people. You do something bad for somebody, they're going to tell everybody they know. And that's why you're coming to SDI. That's why you're learning. That's why you're here. And you're going to get those knowledge and you're going to get those skills. And if you keep going on top of that, the sky's the limit in this business. Before we go into the guns, though, and before we show guns, different types of guns, your four safety rules. I live by this rule. My guys live by this rule. Every gun is loaded. You treat every gun as loaded. You make sure that it's unloaded. Loaded. Second, always be sure where your muzzle is pointed and never point at anything that you don't wish to destroy. That could be something as simple as your bench. It could be the guy next to you. It could be your own foot. It happens. Rule number three, always keep your finger off that trigger. Even in here, you have to constantly catch yourself because you're going to have to test triggers in here. When you're a gunsmith, you're going to be pulling on triggers. But always keep your finger off the trigger when you're not doing your job and you've not followed the previous rules. And then rule number four is simply just know your target and what's beyond it. It's that simple. Those simple rules can save your lives, save your customers' lives, and save your fellow employees' lives. So now what we'll do is we'll just go into some different types of guns, different types of action. Let's start with this restoration that we're doing. This is just, a lot of you will probably notice that this is a percussion cap rifle for those you don't. Be it, it's missing the barrel because it's under being restored. It simply works by cocking it back, putting on a percussion cap on a nipple, pulling the trigger, comes down, ignites the cap, ignites the fire, the gun fires. So the next gun we have here is the Smith & Wesson double action. Commonly, 357, 38 could be different calibers. Notice that the gun is safe. We do make sure everything's not loaded here. It can be used in single action, or it can be used in double action. These guns are very, very common. 
you still see them today. Many, many shooters are, are, are very, very uh, prevalent with these guns. They come into your shop and they're going to want them fixed from everything from trigger jobs to basic mechanics to just being clean. Next gun we're going to look at is the Glock. As most of you know, the Glock is a safe action pistol. It's striker fire. Yeah, most of you know that it has multiple uh, capacity uh, magazines with their guns, although they are coming out with slim versions as well. And it works basically in a double action type mode as well. Great pistol. You'll see them come in now and then, mostly for upgrades. Glocks rarely break down too much. So it'll be one of those guns that if you're in the Cerakoting or if you're into just doing upgrades and customizing, you'll see these definitely come into your shop. This is the old standby. It's nicknamed the All-American Gun, the man's gun, but we don't go by that. It could be anybody's gun. But this is the typical 1911. Now, 1911s are very, very good guns. They're very safe guns. But they kind of became obsolete in the after the uh, World War II area because multiple magazines came out, Berettas came out, and when you have high cap mags, more bullets, more firepower. And also, I think it was also determined by some governmental contracts. The 1911 is a great platform. You can do many, many, many things with the 1911. Later in the course, I'm sure you'll learn all these things that we go into. Like I said, this is just a basic introduction of these different types of firearms. It works in single action mode. It's not a double action revolver. It has a beaver tail safety on it which clearly shows if you squeeze the trigger, nothing happens. Push on the beaver tail, which goes into the palm of your hand, and it fires. You also have another safety here on the side. This is your thumb safety. And of course, it works just like any safety would. So with these two safeties, it actually is a double safety system. Very good gun, very reliable gun, and one of my favorites. One other point about the 1911 is that because of single action mode, a lot of people say, well, I've seen double action. And you're right, you have. There are some gun makers out there who do make the double action. This particular Springfield, as you can see, is single action only. So you do have models, six hours, some others out there who make a double action where you squeeze the trigger and the hammer will may come back much like your double action, and your Smith & Wesson. The next gun we're going to look at is the old gun that they say won the West. Actually, it was an 1873, but this is a Winchester Model 94. The Model 94 has been around for many, 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 many years of service and is one of the great old lever-action rifles. The lever-action Winchester actually works this way. You feed it here through the cartridge gate, okay, feeds up into the magazine holder here. The lever action then works the carrier, brings up the shell, feeds it in, you close it back, and you fire. That is basically how it works. It's a very simple gun, a very reliable gun, and it's a lot, a lot of fun to shoot. Next one up we have is the bolt action rifle. Most of you have probably seen one, shot one, know they've seen them in the stores and that kind of thing. Bolt action rifle has been everything from a hunting rifle to a military rifle. As we all know, snipers have used them for years. Uh, the bolt action rifle is a very accurate rifle. It was built very well. It was built for big game hunting as, as well as military aspect. Very simple in design. Your magazine on this one pops out, you load your ammo, you strictly stick it back in and put it on this particular bottle, which is a Browning April. You would then come back, it would feed up your shell, or cartridge, I should say, that's my bad. Put your cartridge in, and then you would fire, simply by firing and acquiring your target. Uh, great, great gun. It's fun for just shooting paper. It's fun for, you know, uh, just just shooting uh, uh, military aspects to see how far, you know, down range you can go for long range shooting. It's also a great, great hunting rifle. Uh, in fact, I can't imagine really hunting with one without one anymore on big game and uh, that's pretty much it on this one the next platform we're going to look at is probably one of the most popular these days and I'm sure you all recognize this that is the AR the 
This AR-15 has been decked out with some custom parts, and we won't go too much into that or the history. That's a whole other video, and I'm sure you'll want to check that out. As you know, most of you it's fed with a magazine. The magazine is then come up, you charge it by simply coming back to the handle, releasing, and then you would fire simply this. You have your select fire for safe and for fire. On your automatic version, you would have a selector switch that would allow you to go from semi-automatic to fully automatic or burst. Now, the type of action this gun is, is just simply a semi-automatic rifle. Uh, contrary to the horror stories and what a lot of people want to call this gun, it is just a semi-automatic rifle. And being that it is a semi-automatic rifle, what that simply means is that you have to fire it one round at a time. Just simply by pulling the trigger, you have to fire each shot like you would a 1022 Ruger. It's the same, same principle as they do on those guns. Next, we have the 12 gauge pump. I'm sure this is another one that a lot of you may recognize. And some of you may be new to gunsmithing, maybe you've never seen one. This was really designed for hunting apparatus. As you see, this has a very long barrel on it. This was designed for uh, bird hunting, basically. And also, you'll find that, uh, without going too much history in it, that this was the most common gun that, say, your farmers and people like that would have. This was a very economical gun to have. It was a very simple gun to use. It, the, uh, the way it works is you simply just pump the gun back. Your carrier will, will actually, your cartridge stop will actually eject the shell. The shell will get on the carrier. The carrier will then, as you close the action, lift the shell up, the bolt will run it in feed, and then you fire. Now, to do this gun, you have to do this every time. You'll have to pump that gun. That is what a pump action shotgun does. That's what it's for. Uh, really not a whole lot to tell on. They're, they're great guns. They've been around for a long time, and I'm sure they're going to be around for a lot longer. Now, before I get into the, the uh, next gun we're going to go into, let me just go over real quick the difference between a rifle and a shotgun. This is a rifle. This is a cartridge. This is a actually a snap cap for a .30-06, but it is actual in size. And this would be a shotgun shell. This would be a 20-gauge load base. As you can see, your cartridge has your projectile here, your casing, your powder, and your primer. Your shotgun, and this is, these are dummy rounds, by the way. Your shotgun has your base, would have a primer. It would have your powder charge, your wad, and as you can see in here, all of your shot, which is like little tiny BBs. These shots can range in all different sizes. And you can also have a higher base crown on the base here, which would be a higher uh, brass for a heavier load, such as like for turkeys and ducks and things like that. The next gun, and this is one of my favorites, this is the semi-automatic shotgun. It is just what it says it is. It's a semi-automatic semi shotgun. It can shoot one shot at a time by cycling itself without you having to do it like the pump. It feeds from the bottom, and the cartridge here goes up into the magazine, which is hidden by your forearm. Um, Depending on what you're using it for, it can hold anywhere from, and what size also matters. But it usually holds multiple rounds, more than three. But if you're hunting, usually each state has a regulation that you have a, a wooden dowel or what we call a plug in there, which only allows you to have two shells at a time, one in the chamber, because of hunting regulations. It simply works simply just by cocking the handle. You would then put the first shell into the chamber. You'd fire, and every time you fire, either it's a gas-driven piston or it's inertia-driven, which means it comes back and cycles itself without you doing it. It would come back and immediately go back in and refeed a, cart or a shell into the chamber, and you would just keep firing if you're shooting at your ducks or quail or whatever it is you're hunting at. The semi-automatic shotgun, as you know, is now introduced. They're using it in three-gun competition. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you have, have been aware of what that is. If not, you can check it out on YouTube and you'll see they've come a long way. There's different styles. Uh, just like the um, rifles, the semi-automatic rifles, 
so many new adaptations have come out for these type of guns. But that's basically how it works. It's a semi-automatic. It shoots one shell at a time automatically. This one here works by actually cycling like this. The barrel actually comes back into the shotgun and works the action. Pretty cool, huh? One of my favorite guns, by the way. This is the Browning A5. You'll have a lot of guys that will bring this into your shop in hunting areas. It's probably one of the favorite guns of duck hunters and bird hunters there is. And these guns can be up to 100 years old almost now. So it's pretty cool. John Browning knew what he was doing when he did this. Okay. So now that we've gone over some guns and their simple action, let's go into some basic hand tools you're going to need. Okay, guys, so let's look at some basic tools that you're going to need to get into gunsmithing. We're going to do this kind of quick, but don't worry because we have a more in-depth video that's going to be coming up soon. It's going to cover all these tools and how to use them and why they're made the way they are. But basically, you're going to need a basic set of hollow ground screwdrivers. You're going to need some measuring instruments like a micrometer, maybe a dial caliper, or even a depth gauge for doing different measurements and things like that, which you'll be working on. And, of course, the good old-fashioned tape measure. You'll be using this a lot in gunsmithing. Good old X-Acto knife. Um, some pliers, you know, just basic little little pliers. This is just little mini channel locks. I use them quite often. Some straight needle nose, some long needle nose. Uh, basically, some side cutters or wire cutters come in handy. Uh, little basic file kit. These are really, really great. They come in. They don't have to be real expensive ones. You know, you have to do things on your budget. But uh, these are good for all kinds of things. And then there's some normal files you want to get, some regular bastards and, and some uh, other, other uh, bigger size files. Then next you might want to invest in some roll uh, pin punches because those of you who will be getting into the AR courses and stuff, these will save you a lot of headaches down the road when it comes to roll pins. And that also will be covered later. Then let's talk about just the basic ball peen hammers. Uh, you really don't need nothing big for that. You don't want to overdo it because uh, you are working on some pretty delicate stuff, so you don't really want to pound it out. That's about the biggest I use. Um, then you want to get some, maybe some small ones, like a jeweler's type. This happens to be brass, so it doesn't mar. And um, I have a couple different sizes here to show you real quick. This one also has a nylon head, and you can see it gets used quite often. After that, uh, basically, you might want to invest in a bench block. You can even make these if you, if you, if you like to. Um, a friend of mine, Gabriel, he, he made his own after seeing mine. He, he makes his own, so he works out real well for him. Um, also, um, maybe a small rubber hammer or a little dead blow hammer, something like this. I think I paid, I don't know, two, three bucks at Harbor Freight for a lifetime guarantee on these things. And then from there, you'll need a good hacksaw. Uh, hacksaws come in handy for different things. Um, other than that, we're just going to some punches. You're going to need some good punches. Um, sixteenth of an inch up. You don't need real big punches because you're not going to use them often. But if you do, that would be under some specialty things. And that, that's really going farther than what we're doing here for an introduction. Uh, some brass punches would be good too, as well as the steel. Because like I said, brass is non-marring. So with that said, that's, that's pretty much the little basic stuff that you need to really get going and start your gunsmith career. Okay, and in addition to these little basic tools, I just want to add on real quick, you might want a little basic socket set because you'll be taking off stocks and things from the rear on shotguns and things, and they're usually a, a hex head type bolt. Uh, from there, you may want to extend and go a little bit further. Uh, something as simple as a little Dremel tool comes in handy for many different things, as well as uh, the bigger Dremel tools, such as this one I have here. Uh, they come in different for different kinds of things for polishing, some grinds if you have to do some. And then a Fordham tool, which is basically just a, a bigger type tool that has a, a foot control pedal. This is another great tool to have that you would definitely want on your bench as you, as you get progressively getting into it. It can do all kinds of things. And then from there, you would probably want to graduate a little further. You would need like a uh, belt sander. Uh, a small one inch to, you know, maybe a six inch with a disc up for doing recoil pads and things of that nature and stock work. Um, another thing, great thing to have is a mini lathe, mini mill to get going. 
and then from there you can graduate into your your bigger lathes and mills and that will be covered too later in, as the courses and that's pretty much basically it to get started going other than the fact that maybe a drill you're going to need to drill in some some basic drills and um that's that's pretty much it so i hope this has helped you in some ways and I, I tell you, you've picked a great course. You're going to really get a lot out of this. You, you, like I said, the sky's the limit. And hopefully you'll get to see some more of me too. So we hope to see you soon. And thanks for tuning in to SDI.